Hey, what's up folks? This is Keith and you're watching Barber's Auto Help. This is part two of my series on the teardown of this Ford Duratec 2.0 HE engine with direct injection. If you've missed my first episode, I'll post a link down in the description of this video to that video. And I'll also post a link to the third episode of this series down in the description. So please check that out. So let's talk about what you can expect in this video. We're gonna be getting into the valve train a little bit. Uh, we're gonna be describing some things and explaining some things about how this valve train works here. We're gonna get into the timing components and how the timing works on this engine here. We're also going to get a little bit more into the direct injection uh, once I get the cylinder head off and I will have the cylinder head off in this video. We'll talk about the direct injection a little bit more once we get to that point there. So we'll also talk about a few other things that we find along the way and probably go, go down some rabbit trails and whatnot as we tear this thing up. So let's get started. All right, we'll start out by removing the timing cover, but first I'll have to remove a lot of this stuff here. So let's go ahead and remove this. And let's get this alternator out of the picture. Now, before we can get our timing cover off, we'll need to remove our crankshaft pulley and also the crankshaft position sensor. Go ahead and remove the crankshaft position sensor. Now the crank pulley is held on by a 21 millimeter bolt or the head on it's 21 millimeters. We'll go ahead and remove that. Now something I wanna bring your attention to, once that bolt is out, look at this. That crankshaft does not have a keyway in it or the, the crankshaft pulley does not have a keyway in it and there's no key on the crankshaft. One interesting fact that you want to be aware of. Now, you look on the back side of this crankshaft pulley here, you can see that it's etched. A lot of your earlier uh, 2.0s won't have this etching on the inside of the crankshaft pulley right there where it mates up with the crank sprocket. They'll have what's called a diamond washer or a diamond crusted washer, and that's what keeps the crank pulley fixed to the actual crankshaft sprocket. Real important component, really important uh, thing to keep in mind whenever taking the timing cover off or doing a crank seal or changing the timing chain or whatever you're doing up in this area here. Those are important components. If you got the etching, you don't need that diamond washer, but if you don't have the etching, you do need the diamond washer. Something else to bring your attention to on this crankshaft pulley here, you'll see that it has teeth on it all around the circumference of the crankshaft pulley. That's your trigger wheel for the crankshaft position sensor. And that lets the PCM know what position the crankshaft is in. Let's go ahead and get our water pump out of the way as well. It's held on by three bolts and those bolts have eight millimeter heads on them. Let's go ahead and remove those. All right, and there you have it. Here's your water pump, that's your seal, that's your impeller right there. Of course, the pulley sits on the front here and spins that impeller, and that's what pushes the coolant through the cooling system there. All right, let's go ahead and remove our timing cover. It's held on by several bolts. There's four of them that have 13 millimeter heads on them, and then there's 16 that have eight millimeter heads on them. Excuse me, 17, there's another one right here. Once all your bolts are removed, you can pry the cover off. Just like that. Now that the cover is removed, we can now see our timing drive here, our timing chain drive. Um, up top here, we have our two cam phasers and they are attached to the crankshaft sprocket via a timing chain. On either side of the timing chain, you have guides. This is a guide on this side here and then this is actually a tensioner guide on this side. And the reason it's a tensioner guide is because it's held into place partly by this timing chain tensioner right here. This is a hydraulic piston that is run from oil pressure inside the block there. So oil pressure goes in the back of this and pushes that piston out to apply pressure to this timing chain so that it doesn't jump time. Now you see on the sprocket here, it also has etching as well. And on the back side of the sprocket where it mates up to the front of the crankshaft, there's etching on it back there as well. Over here, we have our oil pump drive 
and this is our oil pump drive tensioner. It's spring loaded. You see the spring there. And something interesting about these cam phasers here, and I may have gone into this a little bit in the last video, I'm not sure. These cam phasers allow for the timing, the valve timing, the timing in which the valves open up to vary. You have your VCT solenoids right here, and then there's oil passages back here that actually go into the backside of these phasers. And there's a rotor inside there that actually can move back and forth depending upon which way the oil is being delivered inside the VCT unit there. And that can advance and retard the cam timing in relation to the crankshaft rotation there. And that can happen on both camshafts. That's where the TI VCT comes from on the name of this engine here. That stands for Twin Independent Variable Cam Timing. So both camshafts, the timing can be variably controlled independently from each other. Okay, let's go ahead and remove our tensioner and the guides and the chain. And here is the tensioner. And you can see that's a little piston right there. It's spring loaded as well. But there's also a, a oil passage right there and oil is fed into that oil passage through this little cavity right there. There is a spring inside there that pushes it out as well. And then there's also a locking mechanism that prevents this tensioner arm from coming in too far if that piston is depressed. See that right there? So that's your timing chain tensioner. Let's go ahead and remove the bolts from this guide here. There we go. And the chain comes right off after that. Let's go ahead and remove the oil pump drive chain. And of course the sprocket. And there's that etching on the back side of the sprocket and also on the crankshaft. As mentioned earlier, if you don't have that etching, your vehicle should have come with diamond crusted washers on the back side of the sprocket and on the forward side of the sprocket. And whenever you service the timing components in here, you may want to go ahead and just replace those washers just to be safe. Let's get this tensioner out. Now, while we're on the subject of servicing the timing components, I want to bring your attention to the side of the block here. This is on the back side where the CV axle would come uh, into the transaxle through there. There's a 10 millimeter, or there's a bolt with a 10 millimeter head on it, and it comes out, and you can see it goes right through the block. There's a special tool that you have to have, or a special tool kit that you have to have to service the timing components. And I'll go ahead and post a link down in the description of this video to that toolkit. I bought mine off of Amazon. I bought it off Amazon with my own money. And I, I believe it's a pretty good kit there. So I'll post that link down in the description. But on one of the throws, the front, the forward throw of the crankshaft, unfortunately this crankshaft does not spin. You'll notice you have this little landing right here. Well, when you turn it, uh, probably about another 180 degrees, if you have that peg inside that hole there, the peg will protrude into the crankshaft or crankcase just a bit, and that landing will hit that peg and prevent this crankshaft from rotating anymore. And that's gonna be the top dead center position for cylinder number one. Um, also, on the back side of the cylinder head here, on your camshaft, you'll notice you have these little slits on either camshaft. Whenever the slits are parallel with the top of the head there, there's a tool that goes in and locks those camshafts into position. You saw how it had the etching on the crank sprocket and the crank pulley, uh, and that pulley could rotate separately from the crankshaft and so can the sprocket. You have to lock the cams and the crankshaft in position before you service anything involving the valve timing on this engine. Even if you're servicing the front crankshaft seal, you have to lock these down. Now, if you're high pressure fuel pump drive is still on you can just take a blade and hold that one still and have the peg inside the crankshaft and service like a front crankshaft seal or something like that or the timing cover you don't have to take your high pressure fuel pump drive off or anything like that to do those simple jobs there now going back to the front here there are two top dead centers that you can have for that number one cylinder you can rotate this 
and have it on the peg there and have it locked in position and that can be TDC but if it's not TDC on the compression stroke the slits on the back of the cams won't allow for the tool to go in you can see that these slits are not right in the middle of the camshafts they're kind of offset just a little bit so that when it's on TDC of the compression stroke it will allow for the tool to slide in otherwise this slit is going to be below the deck surface of the cylinder head and you're not going to be able to get your tool in there and if that's the case you'll need to rotate the crankshaft 360 degrees and then reset everything okay so let's get into the valve train a little bit here this is our intake camshaft and this is our exhaust camshaft this is the intake camshaft because it's on the intake side of the cylinder head and it opens up the valves on the intake side of the, the cylinder head in order for fresh air to enter into the cylinders. The exhaust side is the exhaust side because it's on the exhaust side of the cylinder head and it opens and closes the valves allowing for exhaust gas to escape through the exhaust manifold. Now the way that this valve train works, of course, it's timing chain driven. It's linked up with the crankshaft of course through the timing chain and that causes both of these to spin simultaneously whenever the camshafts are spinning these lobes spin with it and the lobes press down on these tappets these little bucket looking things that are upside down here and those tappets sit right on top of the valves well whenever the lobe goes and hits the tappet it pushes the tappet down pushing the valve down in turn and that opens up either the intake valve or the exhaust valve. This is basically what allows the engine to breathe. It allows air to come in and exhaust to come out and it's all precisely timed in order for that transaction to take place efficiently and properly. Okay let's go ahead and take our camshafts out. I have to remove our cam caps to do that and remove our cam caps. And once all the cam caps are removed, the camshafts come right off. Like so. All right, now once we've got the camshafts out of the way, I can show you better these tappets here. It's just a, a little bucket that sits right on top of the head of the valve there. And you'll notice on the inside, it has these measurements. That's the actual thickness of the tappet. And that's how the valve lash is adjusted, uh, is by changing out the size of these little tappets here. Um, you can go up and down in size or thickness on these, and that will adjust the distance between the tappet and the lobe on the camshaft there. But uh, this is what the camshaft lobe rides on, and it pushes down on that valve there. Uh, that's your valve spring, and those are the keepers for the valve and that right there is the head of the valve right there and of course there's four tappets per cylinder on this so 16 tappets in total okay let's go ahead and take the cylinder head off uh, i'm going to be using a t55 torx bit for these head bolts here and i'm not taking them off in the proper way i'm using an impact uh, this engine is going to the junkyard after this so uh, as mentioned before i'm not using proper techniques and disassembling this engine We got our head bolts out. Let's go ahead and pry this off. There we go. It's been raining for a while in that thing. All right, so directly underneath the cylinder head, between the cylinder head and the engine block, you have your head gasket. This is what keeps all the combustion pressures and stuff inside the cylinder. Well, one of the things that helps to keep it in there, if it's blown, that combustion gas can get out, of course and escape it also seals off oil passages and coolant passages that go between the block and the head and this is what's called a multi-layered metal gasket and there's two layers to it it's got a little paint on it and whatnot and that's what seals up the head to the block and here is the underside of the cylinder head you can see you got four combustion chambers here and in each one of those combustion chambers you have a spark plug and of course you know your your spark um, is generated by the ignition coils, of course, but that spark comes through the spark plug ultimately, and that's what ignites the air fuel mixture inside the combustion chamber and creates that downward motion or that downward force on the top of that piston to keep your engine rotating. 
Now, as mentioned before, I was gonna leave one of those high pressure fuel injectors in the cylinder head. This one right here is still in there. Those things actually, actually squirt gas directly into the combustion chamber. Um, before, gasoline engines are usually like multi-port injection or throttle body injection. And the fuel is actually mixed with the air before it actually gets into the combustion chamber. But on this engine here, it has the direct injection design, it goes directly into the combustion chamber. And that, of course, as mentioned in my other video, helps out a lot with the fuel economy. Uh, by having high pressure, um, a high pressure fuel system on this, it really helps to atomize the fuel more once it goes through that nozzle and gets into the combustion chamber there. More atomization of fuel, of course, equals better efficiency, more power, and better gas mileage. So that's one of the things that makes the direct injection fuel injection system so great and so, so wonderful for a lot of these modern cars here. Now let me see if I can get one of these valves out so you can take a look at it. And we'll go over the components of the valve. That one keeper out. There we go. All right, that's your valve spring right there. Of course, I just knocked out these keepers here. Set that side there. And inside, you have your valve seal. That's what keeps the oil that, you know, is being slung around inside the top of the cylinder head uh, from getting down into the combustion chamber. It seals that valve off for you. So let's push that valve through. There you go. And this is an intake valve. And you can see that there's a lot of carbon buildup on the back side of this intake valve. That's, that's one of the downfalls of these earlier design direct injection uh, engines. You know, you don't get fuel being sprayed on the back side of the intake valve, so you do get a lot of carbon buildup back there. That's not actually from this engine sitting out in the weather. That's just regular coking and stuff that, and carbon buildup that you get naturally on these direct injection engines here. Doing an intake cleaning periodically on one of these, it's not a bad idea. I would, I would highly suggest it. And there's your valve stem there, and that's the little groove that the keepers uh, go into there to hold that valve in place. And of course, you have four valves per cylinder, so you got 16 valves on this thing. Well, folks, that is it for this video. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed this and that maybe you learned something from it. If you have any questions, please comment down below. Um, also, please read the entire description down below this video before you apply any of this knowledge. There may be some things I need to clarify. That's where I do that. Uh, also, read the disclaimer at the very end of it. And stay tuned for my next video. I'm going to have a, uh, a part three of this series, and we're going to get into the engine block on it. So thanks again for watching. Have a good one.